Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. I am Amalgam Ash, and today I want to show you exactly what settings are changed whenever you create a new game using the RPG developer Bakken Create a New Game menu. Whenever you step through the options in this menu, you are creating your very first project file. But what each page of this menu actually does is change certain settings in that project file that you can change back to whatever you wish after you've created your game without having to come back to this wizard. After I show you the parameters, you'll be able to take a game that you made using, say, the camera settings of player central view and change that to one of using the player rear view, first person view, side view, or any of the others. And you'll be able to change your operation method from top view operation to tank controls to side view operation or vice versa. So to start, here's project basics, and this is where you can change or set your game title, subtitle, and creator. To change these settings after we have made our game, you can just go to Game Definition under Master Menu on the left-hand side of the screen. We'll click that, and then click on the Project Settings menu. From here, you can change the title, subtitle, and nickname under Project Information. It's worth knowing that you can also add a copyright notice and a description of your game, as well as change the version of your game here. This is just for informational purposes to the user. Changing the version here doesn't affect anything in your game functionally. Next, Asset Amount Setting included from the beginning. Now, whenever I make a new project, which one of these I select really depends on why I'm making the project. I usually do simple if I'm just trying to show off something very, very simple for a tutorial, but I do find that it's necessary to use normal when I need those extra assets to show something more advanced or more graphical. Unfortunately, it's not a simple matter to change your project from normal to simple or vice versa, so please select the setting carefully. Being aware, of course, that normal will include many more assets and will take up a little bit more of your hard drive space. Having said that, the developers of Bakken did make it easy to import files into your game. For example, I can navigate to the 2D Assets folder located in the Templates folder for Bakken on my PC and just drag one of these files right into the map editor. This will open File Import. And while I can't change the number of X or Y slices, which is fine since this is just one animation for one character, one sprite, I can change the X and Y slice dimensions, the name, the scale, I can set the billboard type, select between the motion names, change the display time for animation, select the playback loop type, and whether or not to use sRGB. If you try to do it with Effectseer files or .efks, it will actually import and display right on the map during runtime of the engine. There. Did you see the slash animation? Slash. Those animations in particular do not loop, but if they did, they would be looping on the map. And of course, you can set them to loop. You can also use this to drag 3D objects onto your map. You can change the shape of the collision during the file import process, placement of collision, scale of the collision, and you can check the box for same settings hereafter to make additional file imports streamlined. This is just one way of importing assets into Bakken. Okay, so next is the player settings for main cast. If you have just flown through the wizard, you may not have a sprite for your character for moving or a graphic for the layout. And this is very easy to correct. We can see that there is no sprite on top of my start marker. That means I did not start out with one. We're just gonna go over to game definition on the left-hand side, and then we'll click on start settings. And then in the upper left-hand corner, under main cast, operating cast, we can see that while we do have a hero character created, we do not have a graphic for them. So we can click on hero, which will take us to the asset picker, and we can browse the asset picker for our hero sprite for movement. For this example, I'll just navigate to 2D cast assets, slice animation, 2D casts, hero casts, and elf A. Elf A will work just fine. Add and exit. I'll get a pop-up saying what's been added, and there's elf A. Now, even though I've added the walking sprite, I haven't added the layout sprite. So we'll just go over to the database. Again, on the left-hand side of the screen, it will usually default to the casts menu. And then from here, we can just select our elf A cast. And we can choose an icon image as well as a graphic for layout. This time, I'm going to navigate to 2D cast assets, images and textures, 2D casts, hero casts, and then the elf A folder, which has its own four layouts folder. And that's where I'll select this handsome portrait for my elf. We'll just click add and exit in the bottom right, get our prompt. And this is what we could have started out with if we would chosen these settings at the beginning of project creation. You can also change the name of the hero here at the bottom of the screen during project creation. And of course that can be changed in the 
database menu as well. Just click on the cast that you need to change the name of and change their name here. Right under name in the upper left hand corner of this pane. All right, next comes an exciting part, camera settings. If you chose player central view, your game's camera will look like this by default. Player central view determines the starting position of the camera's X, Y, and Z position in relation to its target as well as its rotation. This can be changed, of course, during test play by holding down the right mouse button and dragging, using the R and F keys on your keyboard to adjust pitch, or using the right stick of your controller. The right joypad left and right will change the horizontal rotational axis, and the up and down will change the vertical rotational axis. What this setting is actually changing is your default camera in your camera tool menu. So what I did was create two project files going through the steps in the wizard. On the left, my project file is using the default camera angle settings, and on the right, my project file is using the first person camera settings. All of the properties that are created by making this choice when you are creating your new game are right here under the change information section, camera and gazing target. On the left project, you can see that my camera settings are set to angle of view 10 and near clip one. While on the right, you can see that my settings are angle of view 30 and near clip 0.1. The near clip is how close the camera can be to objects on the map before it is able to see through them. So we can actually raise this number right here on the first person project. And once we get to 0.6, we can see through the player. Now it's sort of a real first person view that's being simulated, not us looking at our sprite. But I'll change that back. On the left project, our position X, Y, and Z values are set to 0, 14.14, and 16.85. While on the right, the X, Y, Z are almost all set to zero. We've got 0 0.03. Position Y is just set to zero, and position Z is set to 0 0.59. There is some precision after that, but I don't think it matters too much. For the project on the left, our camera's angle X is set to negative 40, and angle Y is set to zero. While on the project to the right, the first person mode, camera angle X is set to zero, and angle Y is set to three. Now, the only thing that's actually changed under our gazing target settings is the offset Y. That's 0.6 for the overhead camera, and it's 0.9 for the first person camera. So as you can see, it's easy to change these settings in the camera tool. And the point of all this is to show you that even if you've chosen your camera settings during the initial steps you take to make your game, it's not too late to overwrite those settings and create any other kind of camera that you want for your project. That takes care of camera settings. Next is operation method. And this is kind of an exciting subject for me because this one is really, really interesting. By default, you can choose from top view operation, tank controls, or side view operation. If you select any of these and after you've made your project find that you didn't like this control type, it is easy to change to any of the other control types or make your own from scratch. We'll select top view operation just to get the project file created and I'll show you what's going on. And by the way, while we're here, we'll go ahead and remember that we did not have jump selected and we didn't have inertial movement selected. These are things that you can select or deselect before you begin creating your project. However, it is easy to toggle them back on or off in the editor after the project is created. To change all of these last settings, we'll just head to the game definition menu again on the left side of the screen, and we'll go to the rules and operations menu. This is gonna be one of the most useful menus that you can navigate to after you've created your game. I've just adjusted some of the sizes of the panes to make everything more readable. But right here in the center of the screen, at the top under operation, you can choose between basic operation and tank controls. If you toggle one off, the other one will toggle on. With tank control on, you can adjust your steering speed. Under camera operation, you can choose to disable camera operation, get behind player automatically, and tell the camera to dodge obstacles. Under the movement and inertia menu, you can enable or disable use inertia to move. This is the inertia setting in the game creation menu. You can also specify the camera movement range here, as well as adjust elements for mouse input. On the right side of the screen are the assign input device settings. This looks like a bunch of complicated code, but don't be overwhelmed. We're just gonna take a look at this, understand what it is and how we can change this in a non-destructive, non-dangerous way. There's a lot to go over here, but we're just going to check the basics. All of these numbered lines basically represent lines of code. When your game starts, these are being interpreted. Each line of code is actually binding one of the inputs on your keyboard, mouse, or joypad 
to a specific output function. You can even assign multiple inputs to have the same output function. For example, on line 10, the up arrow and the W key are bound to the action of up. This means that if you press the W key or the up arrow on your keyboard, your character will perform the up action, which is walking upwards. Down is bound to the S key and down arrow. A little lower in the code, decide is bound to the Z key, the space key, and the enter key. You will notice throughout this code that there are lines that start with these double slashes. And if you did not select jump in your game creation menu, these double slashes will be in front of line 75 and line 76. Bind jump to X and bind jump to pad button 3. This means that when you press X on your keyboard, nothing will happen. Your character will not jump. It is very easy to change this to toggle back on. All you have to do is remove the slashes. One way of doing that is to click on the slashes and just backspace them out. It's actually that easy. You see, in code, or in this particular language, these slashes represent comments. Whenever a line has comments, the programmer can add notes for themselves or another user. Here, I'm leaving a note that says I can't type. Now, we don't want to remove all of the forward slashes on here because some of them are commenting out lines that are not code, such as this comment line here is just telling us that this section is for jumping. And this line here is telling us that this next section is for shooting. But we did remove the forward slashes in front of the bind commands. And now when we play our game, we can press X and our character will jump. We have re-enabled the jump. If you want to re-disable the jump or disable any other command, you know what to do. Just comment them out. And if you've played with this so much that you're afraid that you've changed something irreversibly, fear not. At the top of the screen, you can click Restore Default Settings. There, even if we delete the entire thing, once we click Restore Default Settings, they'll all come back. You can change the inputs here as well. You don't have to keep Jump as the X key. You can change it to Space. Now you'll notice that there are these odd little semi-transparent squares. These just represent the Tab key as having been pressed during this line of code. They're not necessary to include, but I like to hit the Tab key just to keep things readable. If you'd like to remove the X key as your jump key, you can just backspace it out and type in space. The caps don't really matter here. If you want to assign a second key on your keyboard to also be bound to jump, you can separate this from the next input with a comma. I'm going to press tab to keep things uniform. And then let's say I want to assign the J key for jump. Just type a J and now you're done. I'll take these forward slashes out. And now when I test play my game, I'll be able to jump using the space key or the J key. You can continue assigning inputs in this way to jump, action one, down, decide any of these outputs. Boing. All right, guys, I hope you found this tutorial useful. Please stay tuned for my next one where I'm going to be going over changing all of the joypad keys. We actually have access to every single button on a joypad controller, and I'm going to show you how to utilize that in the next video. Thank you for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye for now.